Thank you. And the uh, audio bouncing? The audio is working? Okay, cool. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, thank you again for this opportunity we just have to meet together and talk about your creation. We thank you for math. And I thank you for these students who suggest that you just be glorified in what we do here this day, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, so uh, time to take off the gloves. Let's do some real integration. Double integrals with... Non rectangular bounds. So, roughly speaking, you know, the, there's two kind of things that we look at. Some, one could be like this, the other one. Could be like, let's see here. So this would be a type one region. This would be a so-called type two region. The point with both of these <coughs> is you can draw an approximating rectangle in these in a systematic way on the whole thing, right? Bless you. Or what is it we're supposed to say? You're so good looking. Let's see here. No. It's not even a thing. It's not even a thing? Oh, okay. Hey, I see what you're trying to do there. Um, <clears throat> so the point is, if I, if I draw a typical vertical line segment or horizontal line segment, you always get a top and a bottom or a left and a right, right? So type 1, there's some kind of inequality. If I take a point in here, x comma y, what can I say? If this is x equals to a, and if this over here is x equals to b, I have a less than or equal to x less than or equal to b, right? And if the top function is, say, g2 of x, and the, the, the bottom curve here is y is equal to g1 of x, I also have g1 of x less than or equal to y less than or equal to g2 of x, right? So I have, I have this kind of description of a type 1 region. And on a type 2 region, I have what? I have, let's see here, maybe this is y equals to d, and here is y equals to c. This one might be x is equal to, say, h2 of y, whereas the left would be perhaps x is equal to h1 of y. And you see for type 2, I have this set of inequalities for a typical point x comma y in this region. And for it to be type 1 or type 2, it has to satisfy these inequalities for every single point in the region. That's what makes it type 1 or type 2. Um, but I have c less than or equal to y less than or equal to d. And I've got h1 of y less than or equal to x less than or equal to h2 of y. So for these kinds of uh, convoluted uh, regions, we also have a, an integration theorem, um, much like the iterated result I told you last time. Really, that was just a special case of these more general things I'm about to tell you. So if, if, the, um, if the pictured region, let's say, is called um, d, then the double integral over d of some continuous function, let's say f of x, y, dA. So I'm assuming f is continuous on this, on this domain, d. Well, this can be calculated by integrating from a to b, and then from integrating from g1 of x to g2 of x, f of x comma y, and then the order of the differentials is not up for grabs here, dy dx. So that's actually how you do the cal calculate the double integral over a type 1 region, just like that. Now type 2. 
if this thing is, let's say, s, then the double integral over s of f of x, y, dA, where again, I'm assuming f is continuous over s, is equal to the integral from c to d, integral from h1 of y to h2 of y, f of x, y, um, dx, dy. <coughs> Bless you. Gesundheit. All right, so <coughs> this is how we do it. It's okay. I can't explain. <laughs> All right, so um, <laughs> let's look at an example. Um, let D be bounded by Y equals X and Y equals X squared, right? Calculate the integral over d of x, y, dA. It's a quint it's a quintigral. <laughs> yeah, it's a thing, indeed. You could do that. Certainly. If you had some kind of uh, five-dimensional phase space, that might represent something. Okay, anyway, so we got here. First things first is you have to figure out what the bounds mean, right? This is the same annoying problem you faced in Calculus 1 or Calculus 2, where we had to set up those approximating rectangles, right? I'm, I'm just, there's really no approximating rectangles here so much. It's just, it's the same kind of logic, right? So I have to make my graph. Here's x, here's x squared, right? And I, I want to find the points of intersection. Of course, that's not hard. I just set y equal to y. x is equal to x squared gives me what? x equal to 0, x equals to 1. Now you got choices here, right? We can either, this is, this is one of those very special regions, which is what? It's both type 1 and type 2. I can set up this region either as a type 1 region, like that, or as a type 2 region based on this kind of idea, right? So the type 1 description is what? zero, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to one. And a typical point right there, right, x, y is what? What does it have? It has x squared, less than or equal to y, less than or equal to x. That's my type one description. Since this is a nice example, I'll also look at the type two description. What would the type two description be here? kind of funny. Y also goes between 0 and 1. That's just a quirk of this example. And then what I want is the um, x between what and what. I sometimes call this the left x and I call this the right x. What's the formula for the left x? This, this point right here has what? x equals to y. This point right here has what? It has x equals to square root of y, right? It's clear it's the positive square root because of where we are. And so the type 2 description would be something like y less than or equal to x less than or equal to square root of y. So how do you guys actually want to calculate the integral, type 1 or type 2? I, 
I don't know. Type 1, I'll take it then. Yeah, type 1, no square roots. I'll accept that. This is just a uh, dislike of square roots. I, I, can, I can agree with it. I, I, I do, I don't know, I guess square roots are OK. It's fractions that I hate. But I'm, I'm trying to be more diverse in my thinking, but not there yet. All right, so integrate from x to x squared of xy, what is it? dy dx, right? Now here, I definitely can't use the trick I, ta I ta told you about at the end of last class, right? I can't just multiply integrals because the outer integral and the inner integral depend on each other. I mean, it's like they're, you have to do them in order. You can't just multiply integrals here. So integral from 0 to 1. And let's see, y integrates to what? 1 half y squared, right? See, so I get x over 2 times x to the fourth minus x squared dx. I'm going to clean that up just a bit. That's the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 half x to the fifth minus 1 half x cubed dx from 0 to 1. My favorite kind of integral. This is 1 twelfth minus 1 eighth. Minus a quarter, I guess. Is that right? Doesn't seem right. Nah, it's not right. How did I get one eighth and one twelfth there? Like that, guys? What's that? So when I integrate x to the fifth, I get 1 sixth x to the sixth. 1 sixth times 1 half gives me 12, 1 twelfth. When I integrate x cubed, I get a quarter. And then a quarter times a half gives me an eighth. I'm evaluating from 0 to 1, which means I don't really have to think too hard about how the evaluation goes, right? I just get 1 to the eighth or I mean 1 to the sixth or 1 to the fourth. Those are 1. So I just get the frag difference of the fractions, which apparently is negative uh, 1 over 24, yeah. Remember that, um, hmm, that is troubling. Oh, you see what I did? Very good. You guys already found it. What's the mistake? Which is, which is the lower bound, which is the upper bound? See, x squared is below x. I wrote it correct up here, but then I failed to put it into practice down here. So you got to flip these, right? What does that do? Put the minus, 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 plus, minus, plus, plus, there. There, that feels better. Yes, the integral of a positive function <laughs> should give us a positive number. <laughs> right. All right, what's the average of the function xy over this region d? How do you figure out the average of xy on this region d? What do you do? What's the definition of an, of an average of a function of two variables over some, some bounded domain? Well, the way this works is f average is equal to what? Hmm. 
What do you have to weight the average by to be fair? Do you guys remember what the average was of a function of one variable in calc 1 or whatever? What do we do? We do integral of f of x dx from a to b. What do we divide by? What's that? Remember b, b minus a. We divide by the length of the integration region. So here we divide by the area. So I have to divide by the area of d. So what's the area of d? Integral over d of dA, right? If we integrate dA over d, that gives us the area. But what is that? Integral from 0 to 1, integral from x squared to x, and then dy dx. What does that give us? That gives us the integral from 0 to 1 of x squared minus x dx. I would like to point out to you, at this point, you should recognize this as something you did before, right? Remember when we calculated areas between curves? We look at the typical approximating rectangle. Like, what's the typical approximating rectangle here? If you looked at this little, little thing right here, what's the dA from that? Top, which is x minus x squared. What's the width of it? dx, right? That's the infinitesimal area at that one approximating rectangle that we added them up. We didn't do double integrals before because we didn't know them, right? But really what you were doing is just skipping, I mean, you're doing one of the things in the double integral. What I'm trying to say is you should get back to where you were before in calculus here, right? Does this, do you know what I'm talking about? Am I just talking about stuff you never did? I mean, throw me a bone, something. I got a thumb. I guess I'll have to be content with that for now. Anyway, my point is this should not be the first time you've seen this sort of thing. But anyway, this is what? One third minus one half, which is one sixth. And so therefore the average is what? Oh no, what have I done? did it again, didn't I? Yep. Oh, gosh. Come on, guys. You got to stop me. So that should have been good grief. I knew the answer was a sixth. But obviously, I, um, my x minus x squared was very questionable. Um, and so that's what? That's a, that's a quarter, right? So the average of, the average of x, y. Um, over dA is a quarter. I mean, over, over d is a quarter. If you want to think about what that means geometrically, it's kind of interesting, right? So if you were, look at, if you were to look at the graph of z equals to xy, if you were to take, um, you know, like a sliver that was that was one one quarter high, right, in the same shape, right. Then the the volume of that would be the same as the volume of the actual graph z equals x y, which is what. It's part of a. I don't know, it's, it's something weirder, right? It starts at zero and it, it's, it's got, it's, it goes out to one here. It, it's, who knows what it looks like exactly, I don't know. Whatever, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. The, the, the actual volume under the hyperboloid. But geometrically what that means is you could replace it with like a little, little can, um, height one quarter, and the area times one quarter gives me um, 124th, right?
All right, I shut up. About that. Any questions about what we're doing? No. Let me try to find a problem, which is more of a problem. Oh man, tell me I left that. Ah. Oh. I printed out notes to bring with me today and I left them in my office. Wouldn't you know it? Danica? Oh, she's not. Oh, come on. I brought her test today. Err. I have to look up the problem. If I just make up problems and try to integrate them, they either work out to be too easy or too difficult. Yes. So let me try to find something that's just right. Goldilocks problems, right? Let's see here. Do 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 do. do. Come on, where'd you go? Oh, there it is. There's a few other kinds of applications for double integrals that you'll want to know about. Um, the one is the average. Um, other big applications are called moments of inertia, um, or like the center of mass, the so-called, or the centroid. Uh, how, do you, how do you find the centroid of a region? Now we'll talk about that some other day. Let's focus on the mechanics here today. Where did that go? All right. Problem 161. I hope I'm not doing one of your homeworks. I may be. It's not so bad, though, because I already have the solution posted, right? Um, <laughs> So here we're faced with the integral from 0 to the square root of pi. Integrate from y to the square root of pi. Sine of x squared dx dy. People love to put these kinds of problems on tests and also like standard achievement math tests kind of things because they're just they're just kind of fun problems because they're just you can't do it as it as it stands right can you integrate sine of x squared no it doesn't have an elementary antiderivative so what you got to do is to flip the bounds. All right, What's the, what is, how is this presented? This is presented as a type what? This is implicitly what? Yeah, type 2, right? So let's write down the inequalities that are implicit here. y less than or equal to x less than or equal to the square root of pi, right? 0 less than or equal to y less than or equal to the square root of pi. So what is this region that we're integrating over? So you have to draw a picture to understand it. Um, on the one hand, we have y equals to x. That's easy enough, right? Um, on the other side, we have x equals to the square root of pi, which is this thing, right? And 0, and this point of intersection here is root pi root pi, right? So apparently, we're doing a double integral over this here triangle. So if I want to rewrite this as a type 1 integral, what do I do? What's that? A nice squeak. Oh, yes. Um, so our x, x goes between what? 0, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to the square root of pi. That is a, 
I'm sorry, that keeps happening. That does not generally happen. This is a fortunate accident of this example and of this example. That generally does not happen. It's because y equals x has been involved, which makes, when we change bounds, the, the constant bound stays the same. That is a quirk of these two examples. Don't make too much of that happening. And then what? Um, 0 is less than or equal to y is less than or equal to what? What's the top? It's x, right? So this becomes 0 to root pi, 0 to x. Sine of x squared, that's the same, but this is so important, dy dx. Now you see I can do the inner integral because sine of x squared is just a constant with respect to y, right? So that just integrates to what? y sine of x squared, and I have to evaluate that from y equals to 0 to y equals to x. Let's see here, so I get x sine of x squared dx. How do I integrate that? Well, that's it's like taking candy from a baby. So u is equal to x squared du is 2x dx. Um, let's see here, u of the square root of pi is pi u of 0 is 0. So if I make a u substitution and change my bounds appropriately, I've got integral from 0 to pi of 1 half sine of u to u, which gives me 1 half, well, minus 1 half cosine of u evaluated from 0 to pi, which is minus 1 half cosine of pi minus cosine of 0, also known as 1. Es bueno? No. Yes. You see why we have to flip the bounds, though, right? We have no choice. So sometimes when you're faced with a double integral on a test or something, if you can't do it, maybe the point of the problem is to test whether or not you know how to change the bounds, right? And the nuts and bolts of that, really, it all goes back to graphing, right? Your basic knowledge of graphing is so important here. Can I erase? So one, one interesting application of all these things is um, mass and the center of mass of a laminate. So with density sigma, so sigma is dm dA generally a function of x, y in some domain d, some bounded domain d. So the, the, the problem, roughly speaking, is you've got some kind, of, some kind of wacky shape, right? It's got some mass per unit area. The question is, what's its center of mass? Where is it? So guys, um, how do you calculate the center of mass for you know, a finite collection of particles? Well, how do you do that?
Some of you are taking Physics 1 right now, yeah? Have you gone over that yet? No? So if I have, you know, particles, say m1 through mn, what I do is I define the net mass to be m. It's the sum i equals 1 to n of m sub i. So there's the total mass. And so the picture will be something like m1, m2, you know, and these are all at specific position vectors, r1, r2. Um, Rn, etc. Right. So you've got you got these different masses, and they're all in different places. The position vectors are r1 through rn, and so the center of mass. What you do is you just take a, a mass, basically a, an, an average where the mass um, gets attached. So here it goes. The um, center of mass r is what it is defined to be is one over m times m1 r1 plus m2 r2 plus da 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 plus mn rn. That's how to calculate the center of mass for finitely many point masses. So like what's the x center of mass here? It's just the sum of the x components, right? And likewise for the y. Right? So if you think about this idea and you want to do it for some continuous blob, some continuous medium, what I would do is I would think about taking this continuous, you know, this, this, this thing up here and um, picking some, you know, here's my origin, right? And then so I think about some little, some little bit of mass right here, some little bit of dm, right? That's at position vector, you know, x comma y, right? And so... <coughs> What I'm going to want to do then, or let's see here. So this this becomes, let's write this more suggestively. X center of mass is one over m summation of i equals one to n of x sub i, delta m sub i. It's the little bit of mass of each one, right? As, and then as n goes to infinity, that becomes an integral, right? But here it becomes a double integral. I'm not sure I've motivated this that well, but err. Where am I stupid? <sighs> oh, yowzers. So what we get for the area is something like this. Center of mass is 1 over the total mass, the double integral over the region, and then what we want is x dm. See, that, that, that's the, like, the weighted term corresponding to the little bit of mass at, at position x, right? And but what, how do you rewrite this in terms of an integral of, with respect to the, uh, the density? The dm is what? It's sigma, um, well, let's say x sigma dA. So that's the x, x center of mass. And then the y center of mass, same song and dance, 1 over the total mass of the laminate, double integral over d of y sigma dA. And what is, what is, the t what is m? It's the double integral of dm, which is just what? It's the integral of sigma dA. Yep. Uh, the actual problem, sigma would probably be a function of x and y, right? 
Right, right. Now, if, if you want to figure out what's like the geometric center of the laminate, what that would mean is that you're considering the density to be, I mean, sort of, you can think of it as being the density being the same for the whole thing, right? So the, the so-called centroid, if you, set, if you set sigma equals to 1, then these give you the formula for the so-called centroid. The centroid has nothing to do with density. That's just a, this basically a geometric average. It's the point in the center of the region. Absolutely. Yes, the centroid need not be in the region itself. All right. My horrible just I mean, if I if I do this right, basically the point is you get to the point you get to the understanding that the x center of mass is an integral of x dm. And then the question is how does that generalize to an area integral? Well, it, it would generalize to the double integral of x dm. Is is my, is my point, which I don't think I've made terribly cleanly. Let's actually work a problem. I don't, I don't think you're missing anything here. <laughs> Honestly, the, the thing that matters to you guys, that this is just was, was, a, was, was an attempt at motivation. That is actually what you need to be able to work with up here. So, so here, here's an example. Um, Find the centroid of the quarter circle. I think I'm going to regret this. The reason I'm going to regret this is we probably should wait to do this until we have um, change of variables, but anyway, let's 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 do this as a as a um, learning experience about integration, if nothing else. All right. Oh, tell you what. No, no, fine. Stick with it. Stick with it. So, what do I do here? First of all, what's the area? So the mass is equal to, m is equal to what here? Integral of 1 dA, which is the integral. Let me give this thing a name, r. Oh, I guess I was calling it d. Let me stick with d, sorry. What's the, uh, what's the integral of dA over d? We will soon derive this, but for now, let us just pull it from the thin air. This is a quarter circle. Its area is pi r squared divided by 4, right? What's r? 1, right. So this is, this is pi over 4. Now, <laughs> here's the unfun part. x, center of mass, right? Well, the, the centroid, let's call it x bar, is equal to what? 1 over m, which is 1 over pi over 4. The integral over d of what? x dA, right? Thankfully, there is a symmetry here, right? Once I figure this out, we don't need to work out the y one, because it's clear by symmetry that the centroid has to be along the line y equals x, right? You can see that from the symmetry of the problem. So x bar has to be equal to y bar. But how do you work this integral out? Well, I mean, you got choices, type 1 or type 2. They're equally bad. This is what? y is equal to the square root of 1 minus x squared, right? Because if you have x squared plus y squared equals to 1, you can solve that for y squared is 1 minus x squared but you get the positive square root because we're in quadrant one. And then, of course, if you look at the you know, type one integral here, 
I go from that zero to that, right? So what do I have? I have four over pi, integrate from zero to one, integrate from zero to the square root of one minus x squared of x dy dx. So the, uh, that's not too bad, right? Oh, actually, this, work, this works out not too bad at all. I take it back. This is actually not too bad. 4 over pi. I thought this was going to be worse than it is. Not too bad, actually. So this is what? This, is, this gives me x times the square root of 1 minus x squared dx. Do you see what I did? So the, the, y integ the dy integrates the y. We take y, we evaluate from the square root of 1 minus x squared minus the evaluation at 0. So the y, the y integral just produces a square root of 1 minus x squared. Are you guys with me? Are you against me? How dare you? You guys are you're dead today. Is it something I did? Is it, th is it that mission that you turned in? It, it's just stolen all your energy for the week? It's understandable. Those Lagrange multipliers, they're all fun until you try to do them, right? Um, so this is another, yet another u substitution, right? We let u equal 1 minus x squared. So I get 4 over pi. How do my bounds change? Um, if x is equal to 0, u is equal to 1. If x is equal to 1, u is equal to 0. And then I've got x dx, which is, you know, square root of u times minus du over 2. Which is 2 over pi u to the, well, let's see here, 2 over pi. That's, what's a half plus 1? 3 halves. So I get 2 thirds u to the 3 halves evaluated from 0 to 1. So I get 4 over 3 pi. Now if that number is bigger than 1, we definitely made a mistake. Four ninths. So, where is that? That's in here. It's somewhere like. So I'm guessing the four ninths is what? Like, what's four over three pi in terms of actual decimal numbers? Point four one eight. So about 40% out the way in this line. So somewhere like right in here is the center of mass. Well, the centroid. If the center, if the, if the mass density was constant, that's also the center of mass. If the mass density was variable, the center of mass would be somewhere else. I know it's kind of neat, right? So what that means is um, if you were going to, for example, if you had a, a piece of cheese or maybe a quarter of pizza that was rigid, let's say it's frozen pizza, all right, and you had a quarter of it and it had uniform cheese density or whatever, and you were to take that thing and just throw it at somebody, if you watched it spin in the air, it would spin around this point. That center of mass point will undergo the parabolic uh, motion under gravity and then the pizza kind of rotates around that. So ultimately in physics one, the lesson you learn is that you can, you can uh, conceptualize an extended material object as if it's just a point mass at the center of mass. That's, that's one of our simplifications in physics one. But All right, anyway, that's, that's settled, all right. So 
triple integrals. What about triple integrals with variable bounds? How's that work? Right? So let me pose a problem. Integrate, or let's say, um, yeah, let's say integrate f of x, y, z equals to, let's say, um, 2 plus x over the region bounded by, let's say, the coordinate planes. and um, x plus y um, plus z equals to, to, to 1. So there's, there's something very similar that happens for uh, integrals of three variable. If you have a, three, if you have a, a triple integral, there's an also a variable bound result. And um, you can kind of imagine that there would be th six different types of regions. I don't, I don't try to enumerate them or anything like that. And I don't expect you to, I do expect you to know what type one and type two means, right? So if I say rewrite the integrals type two, I hope you're on the same page, you can do that. Um, I don't have any such lingo here for that. But the first thing you wanna do, so we're, we're trying to, let's say that this region bounded is, let's call it, what, we'll give it a name. Say the volume is let's say b. All right, so we're trying we're trying to calculate the integral, the triple integral over b of two plus x dv. How do you how do you do that? How do you calculate such a thing? So the, the thing is, you have to figure out what's that what's that B look like, right? What's, what, what, is, what, is the, what does the, the solid look like? It looks something like that, because you've got a plane that has normal 1, 1, 1, right? So it, it's in the positive octant like this. And um, to be clear, I, I really, it's, it's volume, it's volume is B, it's is in the first octant. So what's the first octant? It's the only one anybody ever talks about. It's the one where X, Y, and Z are all positive. No one knows, like somewhere, someone defined where the second octant was, but then that person died and we forever lost like track of where the second octant was. I, I don't know to this day where the second octant is, but it doesn't matter. We only ask about the first octant, which is here. Um, so the question then is, if you take a particular point, x, y, z, in that, in that solid, can you give me a triple of inequalities which holds for the point. So, uh, well, well, we'll fill in the blank here a little bit. <clears throat> so if I take a point in here, say x, y, z, what can you say about that point? There's some easy things to say. Right, that much is because we have the coordinate planes, right? Here's the way I think of it. Um, you think of it, I think of it like a, like a giant triangular shape to start with. You got this giant, giant triangular shape to start with where z equals zero is down here, right? And then you're, you're taking that and you're like chopping it above, right? So first of all, I can say that this point is inside the triangular wedge. How do, how do I say that? What is that triangular wedge? This is what?
You say it's what? Y equals to 1 minus x. I think that's right. Does it give us these points here and here? What are those points? If, yeah, 0, 0, oh, 1, 0, 0, right? And this point over here was 0, 1, 0, right? What's this point up here? It's 0, 0, 1 also. Yep. Was it? I, I, wait till I'm done with it and then ask again. <laughs> so this, do we agree that that's the equation of that line? If you pair it with z equal to 0, right? It's z equals 0, y equals 1 minus x. So I think it's fair to say that y is between what? It's between 0 and 1 minus x. And x is between 0 and 1. These first two just put you inside the red wedge. They don't say anything about z. Then to make z work, we have to say z 0 is less than z is less than, and then I think what you're saying is solve for z, right? z is equal to 1 minus x minus y. So this, this is sort of, I would say, this is analogous to type 1. It's kind of like the most standard natural way we think of y as a function of x. We put the outer bound on x. But you know, different problems require different setups. So long story short, then, this is the integral from 0 to 1. Integral from 0 to 1 minus x. Integral from 0 to 1 minus x minus y of 2 plus x. Um, which one goes first? dz, right, dy, dx. Yes? Sure. I mean, the point is we have this volume, right? I pick a point in the volume. My goal is to give a triple of inequalities, which is true for that point. So the way I think of it is, um, I mean, you can think of it in three. I mean, here's, here's, a, here's another way to think about it. You think about it in three stages. 0 less than x less than 1, what does that do? This one just puts you on this giant, stupid, um, like, vertical slice, right? The point somewhere in there. That's what forces, this is what's forced upon the point by that inequality. Then I add to the mix 0 less than y less than 1 minus x. Still independent of z, so it's like a vertical inequality. That gives you this. Then that says you're actually back in here. Ah, drawing. Right, you're actually back in that. You're not in the front part of the slice, you're in the back part. You're in this, as I drew it over here, like that, right? That's what these first two inequalities impose, that you're in there, in that region. Then the third one pins down where you are in the z. It says you're between z equals to 0. And the top of the shape, which is given to us by the plane equation, 1 minus x minus y. And then. It's basically the same spirit as the type 1, type 2 theorem. I go from the most boring to the most interesting. And I, I can never, you know, the way it works is if I have a y dependence on one of the bounds, right, that has to be, if I have an x and a y de dependence, that has to be the innermost integral bound because otherwise, you know, the answer has to be a number here, right? Keep that in mind. This integral is a definite integral. At the end of the day, it's a number, it's plus or it's minus, right? So I can't have a variable dependence. That, that forces me to put the most interesting one on the inside, the slightly less interesting one out here, and then the, the boring one out there, because I need a number at the end of the day. But it's also because that's the logical order in which these are applied. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yeah, z is just defined by the by the plane and by the by the xy plane. Yeah. Right. But it, of course, you could do. I mean, if you were if you're a glutton for punishment, you could start by going, well, you know what? I mean, there are other ways to look at this problem. There are other ways to look at this problem. You could think about it as I'm going to start out with I'm between z equals 1 and you know z equals 0, right? This is somewhere in that horizontal plane, right? I could take that as my, my constant one. And then I could say, you know what? That's true. But if I take a particular point in B, I'm behind you know, this, uh, this thing, which, which is what? What's this? This is uh, y equals y equals. We say it's y equals one minus x. What's that? Yes. Um, but you need to think about the. I think I have to think about them successively in terms of cutting down the shape. You can't like, <laughs> like if you just think about them each in terms of just themselves and not the others, you'll end up with a box every time, right? Like a lot of students do this, and if they don't think carefully, they just give me back integral zero to one, zero to one, zero to one, <laughs> which is an integral you can do, right? But it's not over this shape; it's over this one. <laughs> We already did that last time. That th those ones are nice. I mean, zero to one, zero to one, zero to one. That's this. Let's see. Let's, so this would say what? Um, I guess you got two choices here. I'm gonna. So I say zero, less than or equal to y, less than or equal to one minus x, and then what do I say about the x? you think this is, this is the wrong equation for that? I think that's right. Because the line y equals 1 minus x, if you get rid of z equal to 0, becomes a vertical plane. So this becomes this, this vertical plane over here. And then the, the last one I get from the plane equation, because the plane, the plane slices this finally down to that, back, back behind that which is given if you just solve this for 1 minus y minus z. It's true, in fact, that this is equal to the integral from 0 to 1, integral from, <laughs> sorry, integral from 0 to 1 minus x, <laughs> integral from 0 to 1 minus y minus z of 2 plus x. That stays the same. But you see now my, my most interesting integral is over dx. My slightly more slightly interesting but not as interesting integral is over dy. And finally I made z the boring one. I'm sorry? For like zero Mm-hmm. Why would that be z? No, that, that is, again, the process of, I'm 